today we're, we're starting on a new topic, uh, mutation and suppression. And so we're going to talk about um, where, where do mutations, where do changes in genomes come from? What's the source of variation? So we've been talking throughout the course about, um, for example, uh, uh, different alleles of genes, uh, some dominant, some recessive, different uh, mutants, for example, Morgan's wide-eyed fly. Um, and today I'll talk about where those mutations ever actually come from. Uh, because it's the uh, it's these sort of differences in DNA sequence um, that are what evolution acts on. Okay, so it's um, so I want to introduce the concept of somatic versus germline mutations. Generally, in genetics, what we care about are germline mutations, um, mutations that can be passed on um, from parent to progeny. Okay? So uh, a somatic mutation uh, would, would be something that happens in um, a non-gametic cell of the body. And uh, is is not heritable to the next generation. So every day, the cells in our body are subject to various assaults um, from our environment, from errors in um, natural processes in our body, like DNA replication and repair. Um, so, for example, if you're exposed to UV light, that can um, create uh, mutations in a skin cell. Um, that's a mutation, but it's not a heritable mutation. It's not going to be passed on um, to your offspring. Um, that doesn't mean these aren't important. Of course, uh, a lot of these mutations are what drive diseases like cancer. Um, but in thinking about um, genetics, we're, we're generally um, concerned with uh, heritable mutations. So a germline mutation would be um, one that happens in a, in a gamete or a progenitor of a gamete. The gametes being the eggs and sperm, and, and these then are heritable to the next generation. Now, this concept is not important for all organisms. So if you think of um, unicellular organisms like bacteria or yeast, there's no distinction between the germline and the soma. So in a, in a haploid yeast, if a mutation arises, that can then be heritable to its progeny if we think of progeny as, for example, a haploid yeast undergoing mitosis to make more haploid yeast. So if you have a mutation in one, um, uh, that will be passed on. So this distinction of somatic versus germline is, is um, important for multicellular organisms that, that have a germline, that make gametes like eggs and sperm. But we'll be talking about um, yeast quite a bit uh, in this section uh, where that distinction is, is, is not there. Okay, so I want to talk about um, uh, different types of mutations that arise, and I'm going to focus on today nucleotide mutations, so mutations at the single base level, and then larger changes uh, that occur um, on chromosomes, chromosomal rearrangements, and um, extra chromosome copy numbers. So how do you actually get those mutations? Okay, um, so you probably have heard about nucleotide mutation level mutations. Um, sometimes we might refer to these as point mutations. Can anybody think of some sort of classes of mutations of, of interest that affect things like protein coding genes? Yeah. Does somebody um, want to explain what a nonsense mutation is? Yeah. Right. So that's when you go um, 
uh, from coding for an amino acid to a stop codon. Uh, there, are, there are three stop codons. Uh, what's the third one? TAG, I think. Um, and so these three stop codons, um, you know, there are many amino acids that have um, uh, a codon that's similar. And so you can have uh, a simple single base pair change that would go, for example, from a, a TGT, which codes amino acid, to a, a TGG. Okay? Uh, and that would be called a nonsense mutation. And those can be um, quite detrimental uh, for protein coding genes because um, if you have a stop codon early on in the protein, that generally would lead to um, uh, what we call a loss of function mutation, where that gene no longer makes any functional protein. Uh, because there, there is um, a stop. Um, so if you made a, a stop codon early, you're not going to get any um, protein made from that gene. Okay. Sometimes these might be tolerated, for example, if they're very, very late uh, in the gene or if, they, if they're beyond where any sort of important domains in the protein are. Okay. Any other class of um, single nucleotide mutations that we might care about? Yeah. Miss sense. So a miss sense mutation is uh, where you have one amino acid codon um, to another. Okay. And again, this can this can arise through. Um, single nucleotide changes. So let's say you have a GGG codon, which encodes for glycine. You might just change uh, the third position there. Oh, wait. I got I to gotta refer to my amino acid table to give you an example that, that's correct. OK, where's glycine? Um, glycine. No, everything GG is glycine. That wasn't a good example. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll save that up for, for a different thing. But if we're talking about, let's see, we can do a, a GAG to a um, GGG. where we've uh, changed an A to a G, and we go from a, a glutamic acid uh, to a glycine. What I've, what I've drawn over here, uh, let me just finish this. If I do a GGG to a GGA, I've still created a, a mutation in the DNA, um, but this uh, still codes for glycine. So that we would refer to as a, um, a synonymous mutation. And here where uh, a, a change uh, causes a change in amino acid, It's referred to as non-synonymous. Most of the changes that occur in the genome um, will have no effect. Or, um, for example, if they occur outside of protein-coding genes or even within protein-coding genes, most uh, mutations that uh, arise spontaneously or are induced will be synonymous mutations um, that, that don't affect um, coding capacity. So you can have a lot of mutations that occur that aren't predicted to have any um, uh, effect. Another um, uh, type of category are um, insertion and deletions of single nucleotides. These are referred to as indels, short for insertion and deletion. Um, and that can lead to a change in amino acid. Um, sequence, it could lead um, to things like a frame shift. So let me just give you a simple example here. 
let's say you had a sequence TTT, CCT, G, 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 C. And these are our codons. That is uh, phenylalanine, I believe. Yes. Phenylalanine, proline, and glycine. And let's just delete that base. So you have TT blank C C T G G G C. But now if we go and we and we um, uh, move along codon by codon, this is our first codon, this is our second codon, this is our third codon. Um, and so there's a change to um, TTC is also phenylalanine, like TTT, but then this middle codon gets changed to leucine, and then the last one is still glycine. So you have the, the indel here uh, in codon 1, but actually it's affecting this, this deletion is then affecting uh, the, the downstream codon. That wouldn't have to be the case. It could be affecting uh, both. Here it just caused a single amino acid change. Um, you can also have, as a um, consequence of this type of thing, um, um, frame shifts. So um, or an effect on splicing. Um, so, for example, uh, genes will have a certain splice pattern. So let's say these are the exons in boxes and the introns in lines. There will be um, splice acceptor and donor sites. Oh, sorry. And so you could um, create a change in an intron, so in a non-protein coding region. Um, and if you disrupted a, a splice a donor site, for example, you might not get this intron spliced out. Just let's make a change there. And so instead of getting a wild type product with exon 1, 2, and 3, you might get exon 1 inclusion of the intron, exon 2, and exon 3. And that would, that would then lead to, lead to a different protein product when that was translated. Can you think of um, other effects that might occur if, you, uh, if there are mutations outside of um, protein coding genes, um, single base pair changes? Any other regions of the genome that, that um, we might expect an effect if, if we created single base pair changes? This draw structure of a gene. Here's a gene, it has a promoter. Um, what if I what if I made a change uh, in the promoter? Could that be could that alter anything? Yeah? Well, we would, we would call that a, um, a, a change in a gene regulatory sequence. So most likely, um, a, a random mutation here won't affect anything, but let's say that there was a particular transcription factor uh, that bound to that site and was required to promote the expression of that gene. Um, if you had a, let's say you had a transcription factor site that's uh, GAGA, a GAGA site, which is a very common um, transcription factor binding site. Um, and now you have a mutation such that you have GTGA. What may result is that the 
the GAGA transcription factor can't bind. And so then you, the, you would have a perfectly functional gene, but now um, the gene is not expressed. Doesn't make any mRNA, doesn't make any protein. So those are, those are some of the, the um, single um, base pair changes that can have effects um, that ultimately might have phenotypic consequences. Um, how, how, do we, how do we generate mutants? Where do these changes come from? What are some sources of um, uh, mutations? Now, I, I put up there some well-known mutants um, uh, that have been described in the literature or in, in various media. Um, and these, these mutants all um, had a pretty dramatic uh, means of becoming mutants. I actually don't know what the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles did. Um, I don't remember. Um, um, but that, that left them uh, better adapted to their environment or gave them special powers. Typically, we're not talking about mutants like that. We're talking about these sorts of mutants where uh, we might have a fly that has white eyes, like um, Morgan discovered. Um, we might have mutations that do cause pretty dramatic um, phenotypes. So um, that fly in the middle there goes from having two wings to making four wings, extra body parts. Um, this is a sort of um, mutation. Uh, it's called a homeotic mutation that um, has been discovered in many organisms, but really worked out well in flies, where you might make extra wings or extra legs or extra antenna, but in the wrong spot. Um, even something as simple as roses, which we're all familiar with, with looking at, a commercial rose is really a mutant, a wild rose on top. It has a few petals. Um, it makes a lot of um, stamens, uh, those, those things there, uh, which uh, are the, are the pollen-producing organisms. And what's happened in commercial roses is there are mutations where instead of making stamens, um, stamen identity has been changed into petal identity. So you have a lot of petals, um, which, is, uh, which is desirable um, in that context, although not for, for reproduction of the organism. So where, where, what are some, some ways that mutations can arise? Any ideas how we might have these changes that occur? Radiation, yep. So um, I'm going to call that an external mutagen. So things like x rays, gamma rays. Those tend to cause uh, quite dramatic changes, which I'll talk about in a minute. So those, um, those cause um, double-stranded DNA breaks. And um, they um, uh, generally lead to chromosomal rearrangements. Or even even loss of, of chromosomes. Other, other types of um, sources of mutations? Yeah? Can this space occur during replication, or like the different enzymes that are supposed to double check the pulse mutations? Uh-huh. That's a really good one. So DNA replication mistakes. Um, and, and you said, or the, or the enzyme that's supposed to check them, so errors in proofreading. So many of the, the DNA polymerases that copy DNA um, also have proofreading capability, so they, they, um, it's known which strand is the parent strand and which is the new strand that's being synthesized. And so polymerases um, can check whether or not um, uh, the correct base has been uh, added to the growing DNA chain. Uh, that's called proofreading capability. 
Now, there's always a trade-off between um, how fast a polymerase is and how accurate it is. And so if you have a polymerase that really replicates DNA um, really quickly, then, then that um, uh, may lead to errors unless there's additional um, proofreading capability. So even though ba basically none of these processes um, in our cells are 100% accurate. Um, just in the normal course of DNA replication, there's going to be errors. This could be, this could be single base pair changes. You can also have um, uh, changes in, um, how do I want to say this, in, in repeats by something called um, slippage during DNA replication. So there are some regions in genomes uh, where you'll have the, the same sequence over and over again. Uh, one of these is um, EGG, CGG, CGG. Um, and so you can imagine if a polymerase is, is going along and doing the same thing over and over again, it can basically, um, when you have these low complexity tracks, it can slip and it can repeat that again. So these sorts of trinucleotide repeats can grow. They can also contract uh, with different rounds of DNA replication. So uh, diseases like Huntington's disease are associated with this um, growing of uh, repeat numbers. Fragile X syndrome as well has a growing of this particular repeat. Um, and so for, for Fragile X syndrome, If you have less than 45 repeats, you're, you're okay, you're phenotypically normal. But if you have greater than 200 repeats, uh, then, you, then you have the disease. And that's because these, having these additional repeats actually leads to silencing of the, of the gene that they're next to called the fmr one gene. So, yep, a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of these mistakes can come from DNA replication. Um, other processes related is um, errors in DNA repair. So there are a large number of enzymes that will recognize uh, damaged or mispaired bases in the DNA, but it's not always clear what is the correct base. So uh, a common example is a TG base pair. Um, and so if you, if you have a base pair between T and G, there's an enzyme called thymine DNA like glycosylase that can recognize that and it will excise the thymine and replace it with cytosine. But um, it may not be the thymine that's incorrect, right? So if you have two normal bases uh, that are incorrectly paired, um, it's not clear necessarily which was, the, which was the original base that was there and which is the incorrect base that was put in, for example, by an error in DNA replication. Okay. There's also a whole class of mutations that just occur spontaneously because of the chemical properties uh, of the bases um, or of the DNA. Um, so Hydrolysis um, can be a source of um, damaged bases. Um, you can have uh, deamination, depyrination, uh, which will affect, so each of these processes will affect um, uh, some bases more than others. So cytosine can be deaminated to uracil. Uracil, of course, is not a, not a normal base in DNA. We find uracil in RNA. But if it is in um, DNA, it will be paired with, with adenine um, during replication. Now, 
Now, there is also an enzyme called uracil DNA glycosylase that if uracil is present in the DNA, it will remove uracil. But if that doesn't occur and replication uh, happens over that, then you'll have essentially we're going from what was a, a CG base pair uh, to what is, a, what is an AT base pair. That's called a um, transversion mutation. Another base that can get deaminated is um, methylcytosine, which um, you may not be familiar with. This is called the fifth base in DNA. It's cytosine, but it has a methyl group added to it. It's important for epigenetic regulation um, of genes. Uh, it's actually important in this fragile X syndrome that I just mentioned to you. So this is a, this is a base, I'll talk about it more when we get to the epigenetics lecture, that's present um, quite prevalently in our genomes um, and in many other species. And when that gets deaminated, um, uh, you get a thymine. And so again, now you might have in DNA a TG mispatch that, that might or might not, might not be repaired. Um, these purines, um, A and G, are subject um, to depurination. This occurs very frequently. And so again, you can um, uh, lose a G, lose an A, and have those end up being uh, mispaired. Finally, oxidation by things like reactive oxygen species, um, superoxide. Um, you can have guanine, for example, that gets oxidized to what's called 8-oxoguanine. And again, this inappropriately base pairs uh, with A. So this is another source of a mutation where you have a GC base pair um, to an AT base pair. So we talked about, um, I'll just tell you about uh, a few other external mutagens um, that are important in addition to radiation, um, one of which is uh, UV light. This is the reason that we're told to wear sunscreen, because UV light is damaging to DNA and makes what are called pyrimidine dimers. So if you have a stretch of DNA, it has T, it's paired with A. This is just the DNA backbone. Here are our bases and the hydrogen bonds between T and A. UV light um, can cause a covalent bond to form between these pyrimidines. And that actually inhibits DNA replication. And when DNA replication is inhibited, that often leads um, to breaks in the DNA. Okay. And, and, and a break in the DNA, as I'll talk about in a minute, is, um, is a serious situation that, that needs to be repaired um, or typically the, the cell dies. And then um, there are also many chemical mutagens, some of which are um, present in our environment, um, some of which we apply to organisms to, uh, to cause mutations if we're, if we're looking for a particular um, genetic mutant. And so there are things like um, alkylating agents. We often use these. Um, to induce mutations in the lab and laboratory settings um, if we want to create a mutant population. These um, add, uh, add an ethyl group. Um, so one of these we often use in mutagenesis is called EMS. You don't need to know the name of this chemical. It's ethyl methane sulfonate. Um, and that typically leads to changes from G um, to A. There's also intercalating agents. How many of you have run a DNA gel and stained it with ethidium bromide? A few of you. Um, so ethidium bromide, the reason it lights up DNA is it's an intercalating agent. So uh, it gets in between uh, the bases. Um, 
it's also the reason that, that it is a mutagen and you should you know, wear gloves when you're using it and be careful. Um, and so basically what these intercalating agents do, uh, they end up distorting the DNA. And typically this leads to um, insertions or deletions. because um, the uh, polymerase will, will skip a base or it'll add a base. Okay. So these, these mutations are occurring all the time in our cells. Uh, this is the mutation rate for um, some organisms. Um, <clears throat> because we do have um, you know, efficient processes of DNA repair, in each of our cells there's thousands of base pair changes that are occurring every day, but most of those are being corrected. Um, uh, so this is the mutation rate in uh, per generation per haploid genome for, for single base changes like um, uh, you know these single nucleotide changes. So in human, it's three times ten to the minus eighth, um, which is which is pretty low. But of course we have a three billion base pair genome, so every generation there there will be changes that occur. E. coli has a very low mutation rate, five times ten to the minus ten has a very small genome, but its generation time, right, is very rapid. It's a 20-minute generation time. Um, and so it doesn't take that many generations um, to uh, create a, a large number of differences. Um, some organisms look like they're very bad at DNA repair. They're very bad at um, correcting mutations that occur, but that's actually advantageous for them. So one of the, the most mutable organisms is HIV, uh, which is the virus that causes AIDS. So 4 times 10 to the minus 3rd. Uh, um, and, and this is really part of HIV's strategy to continually evade the immune system is that it's constantly um, um, changing uh, its genome. So I want to talk about um, part 2 here, which is uh, chromosome alterations. chromosome alterations, and we're going to be talking about um, changes in copy number um, and um, changes in uh, chromosome arrangement or chromosome structure. So here are um, two human karyotypes that show extra chromosomes. So in, in most, um, uh, so when we, when we talk about extra, um, each human chromosome, right, we're, we're diploid, so we have two copies of each chromosome, um, except males have an X and a Y, and, and females have two Xs. Um, and there's very few what we call aneuploidies that are tolerated. So an aneuploid cell is a cell that does not have the typical diploid or, or haploid, if we're talking about a gamete, uh, DNA content. So on the left is a karyotype of an individual with Down syndrome, and Down syndrome has an extra chromosome 21. You'll notice that, that chromosome 21 is, is pretty much the smallest chromosome, um, and so that is, that is tolerable, that's compatible with life. Um, but, for example, an aneuploidy where you had an extra chromosome, uh, really for, for pretty much any other chromosome except I think for chromosome 18 um, and the sex chromosomes, those are not um, tolerable. On the right is an individual with um, Klinefelter syndrome. This is actually a pretty common um, condition that most individuals don't know they have. Um, so these are males that have um, two X chromosomes, so they're XXY. Uh, it occurs like about one in, in 700 um, males. And typically there, there's um, the only reason you would find out that you, that you had uh, an extra X uh, if you were a male was if there was some sort of fertility issue. Uh, but for the most part, these individuals are, are not aware that they're, they're XXY. Yeah. Why chromosome 18? Why chromosome 18? Let me find, okay, this is, yeah, I don't know exactly. 
Um, it's not the smallest. It could be that it has um, reduced um, DNA content, or sorry, reduced gene content um, compared. So one of the reasons it's thought that having aneuploidies, like having an extra copy of a chromosome or, or missing a chromosome copy is so detrimental, is that now the dosage of the, the genes on that chromosome and the proteins they make is out of balance with the dosage of all the other chromosomes um, uh, and, and the proteins that they make. Um, and so if we had maybe chromosome 18 has um, fewer um, protein coding genes, um, then perhaps that could be why that's tolerated. Uh, although I think there, there, are, there are pretty severe um, phenotypic consequences for those individuals. Okay, so how do you actually get this? Um, how do you get these trisomies? Interesting, in, in, uh, for the sex chromosomes, you can actually have, um, you can have three X's and a Y, you can have four X's and a Y, um, and all those individuals are viable um, because for the X chromosomes, all but one copy are silent. Um, so there's this, this dosage compensation system for the X that allows um, these individuals who have multiple X's um, to, to be perfectly fine. So another, another major class of um, uh, variation uh, that, that is observed over evolutionary time is from chromosomal rearrangements. So this is just a comparison between our genome and the chimpanzee genome. We're you know, more than 99% identical in terms of DNA sequence, but our, our chromosome structure um, is not the same. So this is showing um, inversions um, that have occurred in red there um, and so this is actually uh, one of the major differences um, between, between us and chimpanzees is the order of genes on our chromosomes. Um, and this order was shuffled um, through things like inversions. Okay. So uh, you get that through chromosomal rearrangements. And basically what you need in order for chromosomal rearrangements to occur is typically um, two double-stranded DNA breaks. Um, and uh, often something called non-allelic homologous recombination. Homologous recombination is just another word for crossing over that we've been using um, throughout the course. Uh, Non-allelic meaning it's not happening uh, between alleles. Um, so it's not happening between the same DNA sequence. So let me show you um, how this might occur. Okay. One of the simplest um, to think about are, are deletions. Where you lose a chunk of chromosome. Let me get my chalk. So let's say you have a, a segment of chromosome. It has a particular gene order. Put the centromere here. Okay. A, B, C, D, E. But if there is a DNA break that occurs, then that piece of DNA can simply be um, lost. So anytime a break occurs, anytime there's free double-stranded DNA ends in the cell, um, uh, there's this pathway um, uh, that, um, uh, that uh, basically tries to fix those breaks, okay? So you don't want free double-strand DNA ends in the cell. And so if you had some break here, one outcome could be that you get a deletion where now you just have A, D, E. This B, C piece would not be heritable because it doesn't have a centromere. Okay. 
So this is a way to shorten the chromosome. That's through double-stranded DNA breaks. You can also have, let's um, uh, have another scenario where you have this DNA. I'm going to add some additional features. So we have A, B, C, D, E. And then I'm going to tell you that there's some um, repeated sequences on this chromosome. Let's see how I want to draw this. Right here. So these blue arrows um, represent a repeated sequence. And the direction of the arrow shows you um, uh, which way it's going. So you can have homologous recombination between these sequences because they match such that you have A, you have your repeat here, and then you have a loop over such that you're now pairing like this. And you can get a uh, crossing over. So let me just put, so here we have B, C in this loop, D and E here. And so you can have homologous recombination between those like sequences. This is called non-allelic homologous recombination. And so the outcome then is that you have, again, a piece of DNA that's lost. So you have your A, D, E, and the B, C piece is lost. Let me apologize um, for not being there in person today, um, but um, we've got a lot, lot to cover today, so I'll just get into it. Okay, so um, today in lecture, we're gonna continue talking about mutation and um, suppression, and I'm gonna pick up where I left off uh, last time. I didn't quite get to um, everything I wanna talk about in terms of how you make chromosomal rearrangements and the consequences of those. So we talked about um, mutations can be created um, by um, uh, sort of uh, spontaneously through errors in DNA replication or repair. Um, they can be induced uh, via chemical mutagens or things like um, x-rays. Um, and when we're talking about chromosomal changes, large-scale chromosomal changes, those often occur um, when you have uh, double-stranded um, DNA breaks, two double-stranded DNA breaks. Or um, um, uh, if you have uh, basically um, sequences that align and recombine even though they are non-allelic. So um, this would be um, repeated DNA sequences Um, leading to recombination or crossing over. <coughs> um, so I showed you how that could um, happen with um, how you could get a, a deletion if you have a double strand, uh, two double strand DNA breaks flanking a sequence, that sequence is lost and the two ends um, are, are then um, ligated to one another. So that was deletions. Um, let me talk about um, duplications. So we'll go back to our um, chromosome that I showed before. Um, if this is a chromosome, uh, it has a centromere here, that circle, and then we have genes A, B, C, D, and E. Um, a duplication would be if we repeated um, some of those sequences. So again, I'm going to draw on this chromosome um, uh, some repeats. That's this blue arrow here. I'll use that throughout. So this blue arrow is a repeated sequence. So it's the same. Um, it's the same sequence. It's just in different locations. And let's let's put in another. Um, let's put in the homologous chromosome. Maybe the same. 
And it's also going to have those repeats between B and C and D and E. Um, and so when these chromosomes align at um, meiosis, they can align correctly or they can align incorrectly. They can be slightly offset if, for example, repeat one um, on, on this chromosome uh, pairs with repeat two over here. Okay. And so if you have this um, incorrect pairing like that and a crossover, what will result is something like this, where you have one chromosome that has a duplication of C and D, and we still have um, our repeat sequences there flanking them. And you have another chromosome that has lost C and D. So it's just A, B, E. Okay. And so that could be um, that ABE chromosome uh, could potentially um, uh, uh, be in a viable gamete or that, that deletion of uh, that region of the chromosome um, could, be, could cause inviability. Okay. Um, so that's how you can get a duplication. I want to spend a little more time talking about um, inversions. I showed um, in class last time that if you um, uh, that that inversions really do if you compare our genome to chimpanzees, for example, we have many very similar DNA content, but how it's arranged uh, is quite different. And some of this is is through large scale inversions. Okay, so with an inversion, you have the same genes, but they're in a different order. Whereas with a deletion and duplication, um, you, you are either adding genes or, or removing genes. Um, and, and you have for duplications and deletions, you're, you're really changing the genetic map. Okay, so one way an inversion can arise is if um, the repeated sequences on a chromosome are not in um, what we call a, a tandem orientation, so the repeats going in the same way, but are actually in an inverted orientation. <clears throat> So let's have our chromosome again. I draw my blue repeat. So we have the arrow going one way, and then the other arrow between C and D now going um, in the opposite direction. So this is what we um, call an inverted repeat. And these inverted repeats um, can also pair um, within uh, an individual chromosome, draw that over here, where you would have something like this. We have A, B, and now C and D are in this loop, and there's um, E. So because we've had this looping event, now the, um, now the two repeats are in the same orientation. And if a crossover occurs, um, we can follow along what the chromosome would look like here. You would have, right, you would, you would have A, B, and then you go up, follow this um, crossover to D, C, and then back down to E, okay? And so the result is now you have one of the chromosomes that looks like this, A, B, D, C, E. Um, and so this then has um, consequences uh, when this organism is going through uh, meiosis. So there's, there's two types of these inversions that, are, that um, arise that we refer to. Uh, so one is paracentric, which is what I've drawn here. Uh, so a paracentric inversion um, is where the centromere is outside of the inversion. Um, and so that's what I've drawn here. That um, circle is the centromere. And then uh, the other type is called pericentric. And uh, pericentric inversion um, is just the, the centromere is inside the inversion.
and these actually have um, distinct consequences for meiosis. So I'm going to draw out what happens um, during meiosis if you have a paracentric inversion. Um, and um, uh, spoiler alert, alert, what happens is that you, lead, you have breakage of chromosomes and um, uh, inviable gametes that are often pursue, uh, produced, whereas a pericentric um, inversion, uh, generally you don't lose fragments of the chromosome and those are better tolerated. Okay, so let's see what happens um, uh, when we have a para-centric para inversion and we undergo uh, meiosis. Okay. And so what occurs is, um, and I'll draw this out in a minute, is that you get um, a dicentric bridge formed And so this is a, a piece of the, um, uh, this is basically when a piece of DNA has two centromeres. Uh, this is pulled apart uh, at, uh, at anaphase and broken. And then you also have formed, and I'll draw this out, an acentric fra fragment, which is lost. And so these, uh, basically what happens um, is that um, um, the gametes that are produced, um, the, the recombinant gametes uh, are generally inviable. Okay, so let me show you why that is. Uh, and I'm going to switch to colors, and we're going to consider uh, two chromosomes. Um, so one is our normal chromosome. Um, and so that's A, B, C, D, E. I'm going to add F just so we have a little more DNA to play with there. And then the other chromosome is our inversion. And that's A, B, D, C, E, F. Okay. So these can still pair at meiosis, but to, to, to pair at meiosis, they basically have to form um, in a loop. Okay. So at meiosis now, and this, this, in, this individual, let me just write this here. This condition that I've drawn here is what we call an inversion heterozygote. Okay, so at meiosis, you'll have um, replication of the DNA. We'll go, uh, we'll have two homologous chromosomes. And so I'm gonna draw a loop here. And I'm gonna label on, on the top one my genes. And then the homolog that it's pairing with. So it can pair at A and B. But then for C and D to pair, you have to have this loop like so. Okay, let me draw on the genes here. So now you have A, B, and as you come over, over here, D, C, and then E and F, normal. Okay. And so now let's walk through what happens if there is a recombination um, between um, C and D, if there's a crossing over between C and D. So that's where we're going to have our crossover. And so this is, this is really um, uh, following uh, the chromosomes, uh, the chromatids here. So you're going to have two non-recombinant um, uh, chromosomes. So if we look at up top here, 
you're just going to have this this one that is not participating in recombination a b c d e f so i'll just draw that out okay but now let's look at the next chromatid so we'll start here i'm just going to highlight where i'm looking in yellow we're going to start okay so we go a b C, okay, then we go down and we hit a D. We come over here, we hit B, A, and back to the center mirror. Okay, so now we have a fragment that actually has um, two center mirrors. And that is not good. Okay, so we have A, B, C. Oops, screen is cutting off here. We have DBA. Okay. And there's our centromere at the bottom. Now, um, what about the other the other chromatid? So we have this uh, this uh, bottom uh, chromatid here that's not recombining. Um, so that's going to be just our inversion heterozygote. Um, so we'll have A, B, D, C, E, F. I'll draw that in. And then there's one more piece of DNA that we need to account for. Um, and that's what happened when we had this, this crossover here, what was left. Okay, so let's start, let's start here. Um, just follow the yellow here. So we have F, E, D. And then we come down here and we get C, E, F. And what you could see there is that there is, there is no centromere um, in that piece of DNA. We call that an acentric fragment. Let me just draw, I'm just gonna draw it here in the middle. Um, and we'll label that. So that's our FED. And then we have our um, CEF. So at meiosis, um, so now these chromosomes have to separate. Um, that acentric fragment, which I just drew, will be lost at meiosis. And then um, what we have over here is a dicentric bridge. And as the chromosomes are being pulled apart at my so at, at the centromere is where um, kinetochores attach and where chromosomes are pulled apart. And so when you have two centromeres and you're pulling on two ends of DNA, what happens is that DNA is going to break. And it's it's going to break randomly somewhere. Okay, so this this fragment over here is going to break, and I'll just say that it breaks um, after the D, but it really could break anywhere in that fragment. Okay, and so then the products of meiosis. Let me just pull up a new page in this example. Are are as follows. So we're going to have our, um, our original um, chromosome, A, B, C, D, E, F. Um, the, the first recombinant, um, which is our dicentric bridge fragment. So I said it broke after the D. So that was A, B, C, and then we had a D. Um, then that leaves here, um, if we look at this diagram, that'll leave the, this AB piece uh, is our other recombinant product. Okay, that's our AB. And then finally, you'll have um, this, this um, original oops, inversion product.
A, B, D, C, E, F. Okay, um, so I'll just label these. These are parentals. These are our recombinants, the two in the middle. And um, in many cases, these recombinants um, would lead to inviolable gametes. So you generally can't tolerate, um, uh, certainly in humans, um, you generally can't tolerate um, large um, deletions uh, to chromosomes as we see there um, with these um, inversion, um, with, with these recombinants. I'll say one more thing. So I showed I showed, um, I showed um, a crossing over within this inversion loop, which can which can happen. But um, ultimately, when you're looking at the products of meiosis, because those recombinants are inviolable, um, essentially the the recombinant frequency uh, is reduced and close to zero in the inversion. So it can happen as I've drawn, but, but those gametes um, aren't viable. Uh, and so we don't see them in the next generation. Okay, um, so there was one last sort of chromosomal um, uh, 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 rearrangement that can happen that I wanted to mention, um, and that's inversion, or sorry, um, translocations. And this is when uh, one chromosome, a piece of one chromosome breaks. And instead of being lost, that fragment of chromosome is fused to another chromosome. Um, and so in, these, in this red and blue chromosome, if we have a breakage and a piece of the red um, breaks off, we could have a translocation such now where we're left with this, this little piece of the red chromosome um, and that has been added um, to the blue. So these, these do occur um, pretty frequently um, and particularly they occur in cancers. So there are, for example, um, very characteristic translocations that occur um, in, in certain leukemias, um, chronic myelagic leukemia, where um, something called the Philadelphia chromosome is produced. Um, and this Philadelphia chromosome is a, is a chromosome 922 fusion. And this fusion always occurs um, uh, between uh, uh, two genes, uh, BCR are their names, and ABLE. Uh, and this gen, this this basically creates a new gene. But this new gene is really detrimental um, for people in which it recurs because it, it causes a constitutively active kinase. So a kinase that's always on and is always signaling. And basically this this acts um, as an oncogene and it activates cell growth. Um, and there's there's a couple of other cancers where these um, translocations freak characteristically uh, occur. So a chromosome might characteristically break at a certain site, for example, because it's there's a fragile site there. There's a particular DNA sequence that leads to breakage. 